Welcome to Wide Angle. This evening, we will be focusing on the theme of eliminating nuclear weapons. IDSA and the Indian Pugwash Society have just hosted a two-day international conference on this theme. Two of the experts who were participating in this conference are with us this evening. Dr. Patricia Lewis, Research Director for International Security at Chatham House in London, and Dr. Raja Mohan, who heads the Strategic Studies Department at the Observer Research Foundation. Welcome. Thank you. This conference was also addressed by Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh. Let us listen to what he had to say. Our nuclear doctrine lays emphasis on a credible minimum deterrent and a no first use policy. Most important, the doctrine reiterates India's continued commitment to the goal of a nuclear weapon free world. We are targeting an expansion of our nuclear energy generation capacity to more than 62,000 megawatts by 2032. If I may start with you, Patricia, you have just completed this two-day conference. We've just heard what the Prime Minister said. What is your take on this theme? Is nuclear weapon elimination possible? Is it feasible? Is it desirable? I think it's inevitable. I think that uh, nuclear weapons have well passed their sell-by date. I think these are weapons of yesterday. Uh, they're very large, they're very clumsy, uh, they're not small, they're not targetable, they're not new modern weapons, they're old city blasters. They cause enormous destruction. The energy involved causes huge blasts, huge fires, uh, heat beyond Im imagination. Uh, the impact on the human body is, is just indescribable. And uh, these weapons are not the weapons that we could ever use today in the sort of wars that are being fought around the world. And I don't see that they can continue to exist for much longer in our arsenals. They have no use. If they have no use and they cannot be used, then there is no deterrence, because everybody knows they will not be used. And so how can they possibly deter? Raja, what is your take? Do you think these weapons are so useless? And if they are really so useless, how come we are still left with thousands and thousands of these weapons? I think Patricia was right, I think, when she said, look, uh, there, there's been a self-deterrence, actually. Uh, the fact that despite a series of crises that after the initial use in Hiroshima and Nagasaki during the Second World War, uh, the fear of the consequences and what would follow, I think, has tended to uh, deter most leaders from using it. But I think uh, the paradox is you're hooked on a, on a strategic culture uh, that still values them. But today, uh, in many major armed forces, like in the US, being on the nuclear carrier in the armed force is not a carrier to the top. So in some senses, professionally, it's been degraded. But I think the, the, the unwillingness to give it up is partly rooted in the fear that, look, if you give it up, would somebody else uh, gain advantage? The second part being, look, if I give it up, what is the guarantee that my enemy will give it up? Would someone cheat on it? Uh, would someone break out of an agreement uh, to eliminate nuclear weapons. So I think we are today focused on the, the how do you organize uh, a, the, the agenda for elimination so that everybody's interests can be taken into account. And that's, that's a real challenge. You spoke about the strategic culture. There was a feeling when the Cold War ended that things will change. How do you look at progress towards elimination of nuclear weapons in the post-Cold War era. Patricia? So I, I think the, I think what Roger says is absolutely right, that we have a, a situation where we've still got Cold War thinking in our post-Cold War era. I think that's one of the problems. And what we're seeing is that the world is changing so rapidly and leaving these old relics behind and we just do not know how to cope with the pace of change and the old style of thinking. Um, at some point, this is going to be uh, clearly shown to us and we're going to have to do something. At the moment, we're managing to sort of patch through uh, the situation. But the, the big strategic changes, the shift away from the old European power, the old US uh, 
um, Europe, Atlantic Alliance into what you might call the, the new Asia, the, 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 uh, the century, if you like, the new century politics where we're seeing emerging powers. Nuclear weapons have no role in that, but they are still seen as um, vestiges of, of, of uh, status and prowess and power. And that's one of our biggest problems today, I think. Raja, everybody talks about 21st century as the Asian century. And Patricia just referred to the shift in terms of a center of gravity from the Euro-Atlantic to the Asia-Pacific. Yeah. Do you think that with this shift, nuclear weapons will retain their salience or will their salience come down? No, I think the way the present thinking uh, is going on, for example, I mean, if you're sitting in the Chinese defense establishment, the Chinese have not built too many weapons, uh, unlike, say, America and Russia. But yet today, the argument in Beijing is that, look, because America is so conventionally powerful, that the only way to deter a superior adversary having conventional weapons uh, is to have at least some, some deterrent uh, capability. I mean, this is exactly the kind of argument that is used in Western Europe uh, against Russia before. Uh, so that is one part. Second, I think the growing tension between uh, China and Japan, for example, uh, and the weakening of the, the United States nuclear umbrella, shall we say, uh, some in Japan are arguing that, look, uh, can we really depend upon the Americans to save us from the uh, rising, rising China? So the argument that, look, uh, the Japanese had given it up because of American uh, alliance, and if that alliance is weakening, uh, then would it raise new concerns in Japan? So I, th I think we're stuck in this. While the practical utility might be limited, the shift in the power distribution, the emergence of new tensions on the one hand between America and China, on the other hand between Japan and China, uh, and others like India, uh, Vietnam, are also concerned about China's rise. So I think we're in a more complicated situation. So this would seem that the salience of nuclear weapons is not coming down. It's coming down. You can see it in the doctrines. Uh, let's take the issue of no first use. Um, Raja, you, you, you say that China needs nuclear weapons or sees that it needs nuclear weapons to deter U.S. conventional force. But actually, China has a no first use policy. And you can see it in its, it's the way in which it structured its nuclear forces. And uh, therefore, it will not be uh, using uh, nuclear weapons against conventional weapons. And so we have this conundrum, it seems to me, is that we, we keep on finding reasons to keep these things, even though, in fact, they're not in our own doctrines. And if you look at uh, the uh, doctrines of all the nuclear weapon states now, the role of nuclear weapons has decreased dramatically. And yet they're still keeping them and they're still making more. And this seems to be the problem that we have. But there are only two countries uh, that have the policy of no first use. That's right. And in fact, we heard in the Prime Minister's address the call for a global no first use. Yeah. How likely is something like that? If you look at the, the latest UN, US uh, strategic doctrine, it is clear that that's the way they're heading. They're not calling it that. Um, they're not into what we call sole purpose. In other words, you know, the only reason to have nuclear weapons is to deter nuclear weapons, but they're there in all but name. And so that's almost a no first use policy. Um, and we're starting to see that, I would say, in all of the other nuclear weapon states too. So we're almost at a de facto no first use situation. Of course, in the, in the US, I mean, the, the counter to the no first use uh, people, I mean, those who argue that, look, actually, the US is the only country which can afford a no first use because it's so much superior to the others in conventional weapons. And today, the US spends more on conventional weapons than uh, all the many next 10 countries are put together. But yet, the argument in the US today is that, look, uh, if I do not maintain a reasonably sophisticated and large nuclear arsenal, uh, do I have credibility in Asia, for example, on my alliances? Uh, do, does extended deterrence work? Uh, that's one, one part. Second, uh, some in the US argue that, look, uh, if uh, somebody else uses chemical weapons, then uh, do I need to use nuclear weapons first? I mean, that argument uh, is also made. And then in the Russian case, actually, Russia initially, you know, post-Cold War period, they had a, moved in a positive direction. But in the last few years, I mean, they've moved back to uh, an emphasis, more emphasis on, uh, on nuclear weapons. And of course, Britain and France, of course, I mean, they're not, in, in a sense, I mean, they can easily do it, but there is entirely for prestige reasons that uh, you hold on to uh, what you have. 
Coming back to the shift to Asia, and I think you use the term extended deterrence, and extended deterrence applies in Asia. And you said that perhaps extended deterrence is weakening. What are the implications of a weakening extended deterrence? Well, in my view, extended deterrence only works if you think that the country, in other words, the United States, that's providing it would use nuclear weapons against conventional attack on you. And I don't think anyone believes that. So let's call what it is. Let's say that the emperor has no clothes. Let's say that extended nuclear deterrence is no longer actually in existence. What we have, though, is a genuine extended deterrence, which is conventional deterrence. The US has demonstrated time and time again that they are prepared to go to war and use conventional forces. And that, to me, is a real deterrence. I think we had this debate in Europe, for example, I mean, I think uh, in, the, in the 80s, for example, when Russian power seemed to grow and many West Europeans said, look, will the American umbrella work? I mean, extended deterrence is like, uh, is like a nuclear umbrella. Would the nuclear umbrella work actually if the Russians really march down? And would the Americans be willing to lose New York for the sake of Paris? Mm. Uh, today, I think that argument is being refashioned in some sense in Asia, where at least sections of Asians are arguing, uh, would a weaker US today be ready to defend uh, Asian countries? So, like, would it risk Los Angeles for, for, for Tokyo, shall I say? So the, the, if that argument goes too far, of course, uh, you'll have independent nuclear arsenals, say, for example, in Japan. But luckily, in Japan, there's a strong peace movement, and I think there is, uh, there is some limit to that. But the real challenge, I think, the solution that Europeans found was not through extended deterrence, through new types of missiles, but was to find a way of a, of a rapprochement between Western Europe and the Soviet Union and Russia later. So what Asia needs to uh, is, can we construct some form of collective security, some form of look managing the regional tensions. So if you take the political source uh, out of the unfolding conflict, then I think we are in a, we are in a different road. But that's going to be not going to be easy because China's rise has frightened uh, so many countries uh, in this part of the world. Well, also extended deterrence in Europe uh, led to a huge expansion of nuclear arsenals. And at one point during the Cold War, the number of nuclear weapons was estimated as uh, higher than 70,000. And it has now come down to levels of, say, 17,000 or thereabouts. So therefore, if extended deterrence has to work in Asia, which is a more complex environment, as you've mentioned, we would end up seeing huge expansions, which we are not, fortunately, not at least at the present moment. So let me come back to another issue, namely the role of the United Nations. You know, when the nuclear age began in 1945, it also coincided with the coming into being of the United Nations. And the United Nations has focused a lot on the nuclear issue and progress towards nuclear disarmament. How successful has the UN negotiating framework been in registering progress towards this great challenge? So up until 1996, when the nuclear test ban was uh, negotiated in Geneva, it was pretty successful in the period since the end of the Cold War. Um, it did a, a good few years' work. But since then, I would say it's been stuck, completely stuck. Where it has worked is in conventional forces. You see in the landmines conventional, that, that was outside the UN, but it was a multilateral approach. Cluster munitions, again, outside the UN, but a multilateral approach. And then we've seen the arms trade treaty within the UN working and the small arms and light weapons program of action working very well. Uh, so we need to learn how to carry out these multilateral negotiations in different ways, uh, taking new creative approaches with like-minded states who are prepared to, if you like, stick their colors to the mast and, and move forward um, with or without those who are going to drag it back. Thank you. At this point, we take a short break and we will be back.